Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and we have uh, Harley Schlanger on his usual hour, first hour on Wednesdays, one of the amazing guests from the Rouge Foundation. Uh, this morning, I kind of watched an interview with Webster Griffin Tarpley, and I had ten, you know, he used to be a long time, I think, of the Rouge Foundation. Um, most people don't understand that the Rouge Foundation has what I call a humane, logical approach to the all these problems. You got a wall off the firewall between speculative banking and the latest, of course, is the standard bank issues, the LIBOR scandal and more that indicate that the speculative banking criminals are getting away literally with murder. And we are talking about real physical murder. We're talking about people jumping off bridges, going bankrupt. And now we have the latest scandal, I call it scandal. It's scantastic, where the smirking and wide eyed Paul Ryan tries to pretend that he's so electable. Uh, from the extreme ultra right, trying to tell us to sell us uh, the the down the river about more austerity fascism, the same thing that's killing Greeks and Italians and others. It's just disgusting. And of course, we have decision between whether we want to take a gut shot with Obama in austerity, or we want to have a a lethal wound to a to a large artery in our leg from a gunshot wound, so that we bleed to death in a matter of minutes. I mean, it's just it's insane this kind of little game, and they're trying to kind of uh, herd the. The Christian right, the extreme, the, you know, the, the, the quote, tea partiers that haven't thought all these things through, you have to have a moratorium on foreclosures for at least five years because we're in a depression, not a recession. You have to have 0% loans to kids to go to school so you actually have an intellectual class and have people so when you bring back factories, you have engineers and people that can speak English, not Cantonese. You have to actually start building infrastructure like NAWAPA, uh, roadways, etc., with 0% loans and bonds, which you can set up like a Hamiltonian system. You don't want to destroy the Fed Reserve. You want to take it over. <clears throat> you want to take it over and have the Congress decide money, not a bunch of private banks for their own purposes, which they've obviously demonstrated repeatedly. They don't care if it kills nations. And, in fact, they want to destroy the nation state that's one of the firewalls against this kind of level of evil. So, Harley, uh, things are really getting to a boil now, aren't they? Well, I think the way Lyndon LaRouche characterized the presidential race between Obama, Biden, and Romney Ryan was a race to the bottom. Yeah, who, uh, who's, who's the fastest is, to go to the bottom, is, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and here's, here's really the point. Uh, with all the jockeying around Medicare, the discussion of austerity, and so on, none of them are addressing the real issue, which is are we going to stop bailing out corrupt and fraudulent banks? Exactly. And Ryan voted for the bailout. Sure. But I, I want to take this from a, a, a. The reason I wanted to start with the Standard and Chartered Bank is to show that while these guys are sparring on who's better going to kill off the American people mm -hmm. and the American economy. Yeah, exactly. The Standard and Chartered Bank was caught by illegally filing papers that covered up that they were violating U.S. law. In this case, having to do with uh, trade deals with Iran after sanctions and also questionable arms, money for arms and drugs. And the New York State banking superintendent, a man named Losky, brought a case against them. And this led to a complete freakout in the city of London because it looked as though he was going to kick them out of the United States. So the British banking authority <clears throat> put all their pressure they could on the Justice Department. And yesterday, Standard & Charter's CEO came to New York, issued an apology, said they're going to tighten their standards, and agreed to a fine. I think it was a $300 million fine, or maybe it was only $40 million, I can't remember. And then Losky announced that because of the Justice Department, there will be no case against Standard and Chartered. Oh, really? So this would be the equivalent of shooting up a theater and then coming in and, and giving the gun to the police and apologizing and then paying a fine and walking away. Now, this is not the first time this has happened. Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank is going to get off. Goldman Sachs, the, the Justice Department, refused to press charges in this case where it was Goldman admitted that they were taking worthless mortgage-backed securities, selling them to their clients even as they were betting against them on their own account. So they were making money from their clients both for the sale and then also the losses of their clients were the gains for Goldman Sachs. And this is illegal. 
Now, there's another thing that's illegal. I just want to point this out because it's a, a, one of these delicious little ironies. In September 2008, when the Bush team first adopted the bailout policy, in this case for Lehman Brothers, there were a few leaders of the Congress who got special briefings from Bernanke on it. One of them was the Wisconsin U.S. Representative Paul Ryan. As soon as he came out from the briefing by Bernanke, Ryan placed a sell order on his, I think it was Bank of America Wachovia stock, and bought Goldman Sachs. Which means he's an inside boy, and he's actually uh, totally bought and made for it, and he's got his hands in the cookie jar. And this is, no, the, the, that wasn't illegal at the time. It would be illegal now. But, but it's it immoral. It's a form it's, of insider it's, trading. You're it's, it's immoral. Right. Bernanke it's basically... told him which banks are going to be in trouble and which banks are going to get the benefit of the bailout. And he pulled his money based on the briefing from Bernanke. And so hmm. he made money on the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the near collapse of the financial system. Now, is that the kind of guy you want in the White House? Of course. <laughs> you want to have the, you don't want to change the, when you have when you have a run of scum you want to continue scum even if it's wide-eyed scum that tries to pretend it's a, it's Christian pro-life but it believes in uh, Ayn Rand and uh, a hater of God we, that believes in austerity fascism that processes to be pro-life you know, well, sure on, on, on austerity fascism I find it ironic that Ryan is saying well he and Romney are both saying we don't want to become like Greece and Spain oh, come the on. policies they're pushing for the United States are identical with what is driving down the economy of Greece and Spain what will happen so is you, the seniors right, co-pays will be already fascism right the, the, the seniors co-pays the seniors are frozen amounts for social security when they're in fixed income the co-pays for Medicare where they're not controlling real costs for health care they're not allowing innovation in medicine they're not going to grow or control the cost of Medicare equipment supplies drugs or anything no this is a, a bill written for and by the big drug companies by the big insurance companies to crush the seniors and extract as much wealth out of them and cause their co-pays to go crazy and a lot of seniors basically go will take a pill to sec every second day rather than the same day i personally tell them to get off medicine altogether because their bodies can't toxically handle it but the problem is well, this is what people know, are given the important thing about what you're saying is that there's no difference really in effect between obamacare and the Paul Ryan Medicare or Social no, Security it's, it's, budget. It's all kill grain to save them, the budget. All it's of all, them are trying yeah, to bail out insurance companies and the big uh, corporate cartels involved in health care <clears throat> at the expense of people's health. And all of them are prepared to gut what's left of the U.S. economy to allow the continued bailing out of the banks and insurance companies. Well, if you want to have a near universal system, I can tell you about four points in two minutes exactly what they should do. Number one, let everybody buy into Medicare. Uh, have a system where you have a means test. If you're below a certain income, you don't pay. We have a, a very small federal or and say a state tax that would go into a fund to pay for the people who can't afford to buy into Medicare. Get rid of the idea of coding, which is the American Murder Association. Get rid of state licensure so doctors move where the jobs are. Uh, and if also they're retired, get rid of what we call predatory lawsuits, where three quarters of the lawsuits are causing driving up the cost of care. Get rid of controls that prevent, uh, cause medical equipment to be 20 times the cost for the exact same piece of material or equipment made for any other industry at the same standards because they stamped the word medical on it uh, and guess what allow alternative care nutritional care functional medicine uh, you know medical tourism allow innovative care to here in America draw that money and send it out to the counties not the cities but the counties so the counties will decide not hospital corporations not drug companies they will then set up a number of positions they need for doctors and nurses and, and health providers the doctor can set up a pyramid of, of hiring people that they need with them uh... simply pay them an hourly wage it's that simple you put in so many hours work you get paid if you get sick you get pensions you get time off you don't burn out your doctors and nurses and you don't have them all wanting to quit you know, there are solutions. There are simple solutions to this problem, but it means big hospital corporations and drug companies will go bankrupt. Welcome back, 
and uh, Harley, let's continue with some of these uh, important stories. Um, We've got lots of things going on. The Mars Pro, by the way, is another one. I, don't, I didn't see in your list, but I'm sure you have some comments. We need to inspire people with science as well. I know you had kind of a little... Exactly. Okay. We exactly. need to inspire the people to... the bottom of the list, there, there are two uh, videos that we have on our website. One is called The Curiosity of Man, which is an 18-minute feature video on the Curiosity rover that's now on Mars. Yeah. And the other one is, is last week's, or this week's uh, weekly, re- or I'm sorry, last week's weekly report with Lyndon LaRouche, where he discusses exactly what you're saying the hunger of man for knowledge. And, you know, one of the things about being up on Mars that's a special advantage is that the asteroid belt, which produces most of the asteroids that are, uh, that, that come by the Earth, uh, are in this belt between Mars and Jupiter most of the time, and they have some deviations in their orbits. But the best place to watch for them is from Mars. So right. you get a number of great benefits from, and then you can do triangulation if you have satellites up there that uh, are able to then triangulate with what we see from Mars. So uh, there are two things on our website, but I want to get to what I think is the, you know, we we kicked around this question of, of fascism and and the uh, insanity of this presidential debate. The other side of this is that Obama is trying to portray himself as reasonable when it comes to the Syria-Iran question. So Romney looks like a, a cowboy, and Romney is saying things that are utterly irresponsible on this. But the Obama policy is just as dangerous as what Romney's proposing. And I, I want to just tell your listeners what happened this last week where number one hillary clinton went to turkey and she basically met with the so-called opposition forces uh... in from syria now the opposition in syria on the ground is led by sunni radical terrorists including explicit al-qaeda supporters funded by the Saudis, just as the Saudis funded al-Qaeda against the Russians in Afghanistan. And so the, the Syrian National Army and the Syrian Free Forces claim that they're not connected with al-Qaeda, and this has nothing to do with them. But the bomb that just went off in Damascus today, the bombs that are going off in, in cities of Syria, are being done by al-Qaeda bombers who have taken control of the insurgency. So here's Hillary Clinton giving credibility to those forces and talking with the Turks about a no-fly zone over Syria. Then yesterday, the uh, U.S. spokesman for the Pentagon, a man named George Little, who obviously has Little describes his brain power, uh, <laughs> gave a yeah. presentation <laughs> yeah. in which he said the greatest threat is Assad's use of the Air Force against uh, rebels because it hits civilian populations. Now, these so-called rebels are shooting and killing government employees everywhere. And the Assad government is fighting to save their country. Now, the idea that we're going to set up a no-fly zone, as we did in Libya, that remember, in Libya, we had the cover of a U.N. resolution. There will be no U.N. resolution on Syria because the Russians and the Chinese will not allow it. Well, in fact, the no-fly zone will be declared by Vladimir Putin because when they give the uh, MK-17, which is the uh, S-400 system, they probably already have the S-300, any missile, drone, or anything flown over Syrian airspace will be blown out of the sky, including the uh, cannon fodder Turks that decided that they wanted to... Well, that puts us right on the verge of World War III. Right. And the important thing that, that is there is the Russians are not going to back down because they're saying this is a matter of principle. And the principle here is national sovereignty. If right. Assad is so bad, then ultimately his people will overthrow him. Right. And the problem that, that exists is that the people trying to overthrow him are essentially run by the Saudis who are trying to take over Syria and take over Iraq. Uh, as part of a greater Saudi operation. Well, we now, have a, an, an article we're posting up after we had an interview on on Friday afternoon, our third hour, with Walid Shubat about Uma Abedin, the senior executive assistant that's literally the daughter of the woman who set up the Muslim Sisterhood in Saudi Arabia and supports all these terrorist organizations that are now, invading and taking over Syria and trying to invade and have special operations inside Iran. 
So uh, this situation is we have infiltrators and and uh, and uh, Mataharis inside our State Department. Well, now here's the you have these uh, two uh, links on your that we sent you today. One is on General Dempsey of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who said was asked, "So are you planning a no-fly zone?" And he said, "Look." My job is to prepare options and alternatives, but I don't think a no-fly zone will work, and I don't think it's a solution. Then, interestingly enough, the NATO official who was in charge of the operation in Libya, who's from the Canadian Air Force, issued a statement this week saying that there should be no attack on Iran, and also Syria is not Libya. Now, the military people who are saying these things are people who have been in combat. Dempsey, who's the head of our Joint Chiefs, was a commander in Iraq. He knows what happens that with, the, with war. He knows what happens to soldiers and troops. And he's, he's someone who's speaking on behalf of the military, the men and women in the military, when he says, let's not go into Syria. Now, you have on the other side the crazy Obama, who doesn't know a damn thing about warfare except killing by remote control. Yeah, exactly. And this is what's dangerous. Yeah, exactly. In other words, he is the baseball card remote control murderer. Yeah. That's exactly it. And I think the the point is that uh, the military, if it's told to go in, will go in. We don't have a tradition of military coups in our country, although I'll tell you, at this point, I wouldn't mind seeing a military coup. I trust the military much more than either Romney or Obama. Yeah. Well, what's likely to happen, if this continues, is here's the scenario that I think could play out, because we've done an act of war by Congress and Senate, applying sanctions so that the China Bank of Iraq now can no longer even do Shanghai transactions for sale of Iranian oil. They're having trouble with just obtaining even staples for food by by barter. Uh, All their ships are filled with oil. They can't distribute them. They have to use smaller ships to distribute to ports in India. They've lost most of their market. More than half of it's gone already. And now with this latest move by Congress and the Senate, it's an act of war. We're guaranteeing that at some point it won't just be a ship being rammed with a missile destroyer like they had the uh, missile destroyer strike the Japanese flagship. We're going to have, and I, I don't think that was just an accident either. I can't see that the, our Navy is that stupid. Well, that but it, you know what it does show? It shows that if it, if it wasn't an accident, that's another story. But if it was an accident, it makes a point that you've made before and, and military uh, experts make, which is the Persian Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz is not that big. And when yeah. you start putting massive amounts of hardware in there, you're well, begging that there not be an error. Exactly. In other words, it's one of two things. It's either stupid because there's too much traffic there, or number two, it is an attempt to threaten anybody carrying Iranian oil that we're going to ram you. One or the other. Welcome back. Um, so if we look at the current, what I call the... Actually, you know what we should do is we should label this little segment maybe the state of the cauldron because that's the, the, what the earth is now. They're mixing this cauldron of disaster. And the globalists, they rule by by hegemony, by splitting. They want to create micro-states so they don't have to deal with a major state. They They want to bring in dialectics like Obama wants to bring in race war and class warfare rather than just a rational system that allows you to build up infrastructure, generate credit in the the economy, and have everybody have, like the old story years ago, a chicken in every pot, and everybody has a roof over their head and not living in a cardboard box. You can't have 50 million Americans without a future living on on, uh, food stamps and not being able to pay off their college debt and no chance of a job. It's crazy. Well, you know, Samuel Huntington, who is this Harvard uh, so-called strategist, who is one of these crazy guys, had a, a, a title for this. He called it the Clash of Civilizations. And this is really what, what you have in terms of the, if you unleash something against the state. I mean, what is a state? You, you have a somewhat common culture where you have aspirations that can be fulfilled through government. 
And as long as you can have people of different ethnic groups, look how the United States worked for years. We brought in people from all over the world. And because we had a growing economy, because the American system is based on the idea of the future, we were always able to accommodate ethnic groups coming in, provided they became part of the common culture, the so-called melting pot. Now, even in a place like Iraq, where you have different religious groups, or Syria, you had a higher aspiration, which was a national aspiration. Once you take away national sovereignty, and you attack the governments that are, are governing, and look, in, in Syria and Iraq, you have much more freedom for women than you have in Saudi Arabia. You have better wages for the poor people. You have free university education under Saddam. I'm not trying to say Saddam was a benign leader, but I'm saying that the reason the state held together was not just sheer terror, but it was opportunities for people. Now, the Saudis aren't interested in that. They're interested in imposing their Wahhabite brand of Salafi, mystical, Sunni radicalism. And this is a a prescription for religious warfare that will never end. Permanent warfare. Now, who benefits from permanent warfare? The British. The British Empire. The interlocking conglomerates that control oil, that control the choke points of the economy, that control trade and, and raw material commodities and things of that sort. And so that's why LaRouche did a program years ago called Storm Over Asia where he talked about the ultimate trump card that the, the British have is this kind of religious warfare. And we ran into it with the, uh, the United States actually was engaged in it against the Soviets when the Soviets took over Afghanistan. That's where the Taliban and al-Qaeda were created with Saudi funding and U.S.-British training. And now they're our enemy. And what are they doing in these countries that they're taking over? They're launching religious warfare, as in Iraq today, where the Sunni and Shiites are at a war with each other. The Kurds are doing everything they can to break away. That's causing a problem for Turkey. So yeah, the Kurds are again, in fact, this uh, whole region is headed for it's, chaos, it's, but it's not it's just going to be contained in the region. Oh, no, not at all. And the Chinese have a vested economic interest in this Wait, area. You recall the Old Testament quote, it says, Israel shall become a fire pot among sheaves. I mean, uh, the best place for those missiles that Israel has is to shine them up and keep them underground. The best thing for Mr. Obama, or real leader, which we don't have in the White House, including the current uh, aspiring Asperger's presidential candidate, Mitt Romney, would be to call up uh, Syria and Iran, apologize for actually interfering with their internal affairs, supplying, for example, the latest that I've heard is the acquisition of incredible numbers of ammunition supposedly going to be put through the national endowment for democracy which is a cia front to ship these bullets to these people over in uh these so-called insurgents and the syrian free army which are basically hired uh, mercenaries that are coming from libya tunisia and saudi arabia that are paid 50 to 75 thousand to, to commit mass murder and they have a thing called shabiba which means they go to a place like aleppo they'll take little boys 12 14 years of age and their father and if they don't immediately join the syrian free army they shoot them on the spot and then hang the other children in the household uh it's just disgusting well, you know there and was a a very good op-ed in the uh, israeli newspaper haaretz the other day by a man named Amir Oren, who's the preeminent military historian in Israel. And what he wrote about is that given the changes that Netanyahu has made with the cabinet, the shifting going on between Kadima and the other parties, the coalition changes, what he said is he's convinced that unless there's something from the outside that intervenes, that Netanyahu's going to launch a strike during August. Now he said the one thing that would stop bad news, bad news. The yeah, one ahead. thing that would stop that would be if President Obama publicly said, "Netanyahu, you must not attack Iran." Now, well, well, this well, is well, said by the, the fact that Oren, an Israeli, said it in Haaretz, which is the second or third largest paper in well, the country, is significant. But well, let's dissect it. Let, let, Obama doesn't care. Well, let's dissect an attack. First off, Obama gave guarantees he would give our long-range bomber tankers to resupply their jets. So even if they made a, a bombing run, which they couldn't get all the way there and back without our, our bomber 
re, re, tankers that can refill their jets to get them back to the airspace in Israel or to air, an airspace in Georgia where the tie eater has made alliances with uh, with uh, the Israeli government at great stupidity because the Russians will crush them that like they did two, uh, several years ago when they went down to the Rokai tunnel and uh, the Georgians got severely smacked along with uh, Academy which are Blackwater security foreign mercenaries uh, and uh, Israeli special forces they got crushed so what's going to happen again here's the scenario if they attack an air attack might hit some bases they're going to hit a few missile silos a lot of them will be false ones they may hit civilian areas if they bomb the Boucher reactor we've estimated that they'll be within the first month 32 million dead from radiation uh, and uh, that radiation cloud may exceed by a large margin the amount from Chernobyl or even from Fukushima in one big blast. It won't be continuing for a long time, but it may. It may go for months and near years. So we add that to the Fukushima disaster. Secondly, the Strait of Hormuz will immediately be closed, so our technical depression, which we have now, will be a full force depression. We're talking about now massive food shortages, massive collapse of banking structures around the world, riots everywhere. This is going to get nuts. And then oh, we make yeah, the, but I think we can even go to the more realistic and drastic scenario, which is that you will be in a thermonuclear war with Russia very quickly. Yeah, in fact, and, in Russia's policies, people don't understand Russia's policy. Their policy is not to have a large standing army to do invade. They have very good special forces. Their policy is, if they think a war is inevitable, is to do a preemptive strike on a potential enemy, not to play around and, and try to do a conventional war with our Blue Navy, which they don't have a large enough Blue Navy to fight us. It's to take us out with nukes and later now, mop us the, up. The, the other point I would just make is that there's no inherent conflict between the United States and Russia. In fact, no. the Russian leadership, Putin, Medvedev, and their team, would like to collaborate with the United States on attacking drug trafficking, on attacking terrorism, and also defending the Earth from asteroids and other kinds of problems. Exactly, exactly. In other words, we're natural allies, just like we were back in the... Uh before the American Revolution, we were a natural ally of Russia, which is a continental power, and against the, the British. And the where the Russians joined us by threatening the British if they joined on the half, behalf of the South. So right. the point is, you have someone like Putin you can deal with. And instead, Obama seems to prefer dealing with al-Qaeda terrorists and cutting deals with Israeli crazies. And so this is why what LaRouche said in, in the last weekend after Ryan was nominated is he said, it's still the case that we can't afford either of these teams, either the Obama, Biden, or Romney, Ryan. I don't know how we can get an alternative, but we have to fight for an alternative. Well, the most we can hope for is, 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 is complete uh, gridlock. If we can't get a, uh, the government we need, we need complete gridlock so they can't do anything. <laughs> I'm praying, as I say, like that uh, song from uh, Bat Out of Hell by Meatloaf, praying for the end of, of government. I'm praying for gridlock. I, I see another term of Obama coming because Romney and Ryan are not an alternative. Welcome back, and uh, so Harley, where are we going in uh, August, September? From you know, what do you see happening in terms of the timeline, the elements in this cauldron of geopolitical? I call it the selection, not election. It's a selection by two well, groups of banker boys uh, deciding that they don't mind dissembling civilization and killing people with a sturdy fascism. Don't mind starting a world war or collapsing the supply of oil from the Middle East to the Strait of Hormuz. They don't mind even destroying the entire state of Israel and killing every Israeli of any stripe, whether they're regular Israelis, super religious, agnostic, uh, bisexual, whatever, killing every Christian and Arab in the, in the state of Israel. Because when they start this war, it's not going to be pleasant. The only ones surviving will be in bunkers. Well, let me tell you what, what LaRouche told our, our staff meeting uh, yesterday evening. He said, basically, we're facing, we are facing warfare. And he said, we can't avoid that in what we say to people and what we do. That is the reality. Whether you like it or not, we're facing warfare. It's a dire circumstance, but it's not without hope. And the hope comes from two things. 
one, there are solutions. But as you know, just having solutions doesn't mean they'll be implemented. But yeah. the other side of it is that more and more people are beginning to realize that we're in this crisis because the average person has sat on the sidelines and done nothing. Right. And, and we're now at a point where the, you, you need leadership to bring people into the fight. And I want to give you an example of that. Uh, people can go to the website for Rachel Brown for Congress. She was in a debate last night. She's the one who obliterated Barney Frank in their election last year, even though she lost the primary. She's part of the reason Barney decided to retire, because she exposed him as a front man for the banks when Barney has this reputation as this great liberal. Rachel destroyed him. So last night she had a debate. The guy they've chosen to replace Barney Frank is Joe Kennedy the third the grandson of Bobby Kennedy and the son of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Now, he's a nobody. He's a Kennedy. He's not necessarily a bad guy, but he has no credentials, no big ideas. And he was in a debate with Rachel last night. And what Rachel did was she turned every question into what is the fight for this nation? We're facing war. We're facing a collapse of the transatlantic financial system. Here are the solutions. And the question is not, what do I stand for? What I've stood for for the last three years, glass Eagle, Nawapa 21, Mars Exploration, has been proven to be right. The question is, will the voters act in their own interests or not? Now, here was the, the best thing that she did. Joe Kennedy III never knew his grandfather because he was, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated before uh, Kennedy III was born. He also knows nothing about the Kennedy tradition in the Democratic Party because he considers himself an Obama Democrat. So at one point, one of the moderators said, well, you're proposing these big programs like NOAPA. Uh, how can you pay for that? That'll never, that's no good. Who, who in their right mind would support that? And Rachel pulled out a letter from Senator Robert Kennedy Jr., or Robert, Senator Robert Kennedy, rather, from 1968, when he wrote a letter to Senator Frank Moss saying that he supports the NOAPA plan and this is the only way to move in the future. And the whole room went thoughtfully silent. And afterwards, Kennedy came up and asked us for a copy of the letter. And, you know, this is the way you provide leadership. You, you present the facts, you present the truth as you know it and the alternatives, but you have to address the subjective side of the population, which is trying to hide from the reality of war and crisis. And you know this because you've treated patients who wanted to avoid facing the reality of their situation. And it's very tough, you know, if you have someone with a, a potentially fatal illness, it's tough to get them to face what they have to do to change. Well, that's what our country faces right now. We face, we're on a death march. We're, yeah, we're, and, we're facing a terminal diagnosis, and we don't want to yeah. face it, and don't and realize we're trying to say, no, 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 I don't want to see the doctor, even though the tumor is fungating right through the side of their head. And uh, it's, you know, it's festering, and now it's infected, and they can see it kind of hanging off. And they say, no, no, there's not a tumor there, and they'll use the mirror to look at only the good parts of their head. They don't want to look at the fact that our economy is ready to go pop, We've got leveraged bank debt because we haven't put Glass-Steagall in. It's going to blow the economy in Europe, and soon that'll wreck our economy. They don't realize the trillions of dollars it costs if we not only push a war, but cause the collapse of the supply of oil in the Middle East. And yes, we're independent oil-wise, but the price of oil will go so high, our industry will die. We won't be looking at you know, a real unemployment rate, which is around 22 percent, we'll be dealing with 50 to 60 percent unemployment. This will make the the uh, the Albert, the the uh, collapse of the Albigensian the banking structure, uh, so the, the the Lombardi system. I mean, the, the banking the 14th structure. Century, yeah, 14th century, 14th century before the Black Death. Picnic. It'll make it look like a picnic. It'll be like. And the thing is, we don't have an agrarian society where people, uh, you know, have gardens like Victory Gardens after the First World War. Yeah. We don't have a society but, of know, preppers. The, 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 point, we have a, the broader we, point here is that people will duck their heads in the sand, and they will. Well, say, will someone will do something. It can't get much worse. Well, they'll but die really worse. quickly. Yeah. We, and I, I work with Romney Ryan ticket against Obama Biden. It is a race down to the bottom of the septic tank. Well, it, so, I'll tell you how fast it'll devolve, though. If our society collapses, let's say the infrastructure goes uh, and the economy collapses where people can't buy food, it won't be months and years. It'll be a matter of weeks before things get to social chaos. We will have full martial law. It'll either be civilian militia 
and or gangs that run things and the government doesn't have enough military even if they hired foreign military which they don't have money for in order to try to control the society so what will happen is a total breakdown of society and people will starve to death by the millions within a matter of weeks to months and that's, that's and we're seeing the potential for that with the damage in the corn crop i wanted to mention one thing about that obama has been asked by a number of farm organizations congressmen and others to put a moratorium on production of ethanol, which is a crappy energy source anyway. It's a stupid to idea. Leave the, to leave the corn available. Yeah. Obama doesn't want to do that because if we don't have enough ethanol, there'll be gas shortages and the price of gas will go up. So he's willing to risk starvation in the United States for the sake of keeping the gas price down a little bit for his re-election campaign. So, you know, when people ask me, well, which of the two, you've got to choose one of the two. I just say, I'm a human being. I don't accept those kinds of choices. I'm going to fight. I'm going to talk to everyone I know about dumping these two choices and looking for a third option, but doing it on the basis of a policy that will work. And I, I think that it's crucial that your, your listeners recognize that we're not talking about a miracle or a divine intervention, you know, although in some cases it might take divine intervention to get someone off their couch. But I, I think the, yeah. is, the apathy is more is more nauseating than the than the evil that so called rules us. The symptoms of Romney and Ryan, Obama and Biden are just symptoms of an underlying systemic illness. Well, the evil couldn't work if you didn't have the apathy. Exactly. So people who are not apathetic, get off your rear end, call our office, join our army to reverse this, to turn it around. We're a small force, but we're a force with powerful ideas, the ideas that have been tried and tested in the American Revolution. I mean, give my number again. We started to get some calls again from your listeners, and I encourage people, don't sit this out any longer. So it's 800-922-2907. Call us now, 800-922-2907. Tell them you're sick of the situation and you want to do something about it. 800-922-2907. We're really running out of time. The conventions are starting in two and a half weeks. And, you know, it's a lot harder to remove these guys after they're renominated. Although I'll tell you, if the truth of the, the, this European crisis blows, if it, if it blows before the election, there may be a, a removal of uh, these two tickets and replaced with someone who actually has a policy. Well, I don't understand why the issue between is the biggest news issue that hasn't been talked about is the fact that the the bond issues are so high now, they up to 7% in Spain. I don't know how they can service their debt, which means that they're already dead. Uh, it's almost like you walk into the ICU and someone still has a, a kind of thready pulse, but the patient's eyes are already fixed and dilated, and there's not enough blood flow to the brain because they're already dead. Well, the blood flow to the brain is the Treasury and the Federal Reserve have promised $2 trillion for the bailout, which they hope will get it through till November. It's not going to happen, and it's not enough anyway. It's like trying to pour in blood to somebody that's got like 25 gunshot wounds, and you can't get them to the operating room and, and close them. And they've been them. decapitated. And they've been decapitated, and the <laughs> amount of blood you put in isn't going to keep them alive. It's not going to work. That's right. So in other words... All right, till next week. Till next week, onward and upward, or downward and through the spiral, around the rim of the bowl, as they say. you got to use some humor. It's pretty crazy. Talk to you next week. Take care. Coming up in hour two, our health and wellness hour in hour three. You don't want to miss it. Ilya Katz, ObamaSutraBook.com. Remarkable discussion coming up in hour three with Ilya Katz.